Just before we get into today's show, I want to say that this episode is brought to you by Babbel, the number one language learning app in the world with over 10 million users worldwide. Look, you might need to learn a language for a whole bunch of different reasons, personal, professional, whether you're going on holiday, whether you're being sent somewhere for work. Maybe you just want to exercise your brain a little bit by learning another language. Certainly something that, you know, that's going to be good for you. Look, just just do it with Babbel. Now, you might have tried free language learning apps on the App Store or wherever you get your apps, but the reality is Babbel does it better. First of all, they have people teaching you the language, so it's not going to be some weird machine learning phrases that you're going to be learning while you're using the app, but actual useful things that you're going to find yourself using in a foreign language. Further, it goes way beyond the basics and teaches you all sorts of stuff which you're going to need. You can also learn 14 different languages on Babbel, and one of the best things about it is you, you know, it's on your phone, so you can just jump in when you've got a spare few minutes in the day, whether you're on your way to work, assuming you're not driving yourself, maybe you're on public transport or whatever, having some coffee in the morning when you sit down after work, that kind of stuff. Just sit down, have a little crack at it, and all of those little minutes, they really do add up, and before you know it, you'll be making excellent progress. So start learning a new language with Babbel today. You can get 65% off for a limited time only. There is a link in the description below. And let's get into today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I am your host, Callum, our fine scriptwriter has absolutely churned me out a beast of a story. It feels extremely long. It's all about uh, running them on Christian... Bala. I thought it said Christian Bale for a second. The literary killer. Christian Bale famously pay, played um, uh, Patrick Bateman in American Psycho, which is a terrifying, but also extremely good movie. I simply am not there. Um, I actually made a video about running amok, which is this thing. I, I want to say it was in Asia somewhere. Like we looked at on another uh, YouTube channel I do. We looked at where the phrase running amok came from. And it was this crazy thing where people would just lose their minds and run around and just killing people like on some ki on some sort of crazy killing spree. And um, yeah, they called it running amok and that's where the phrase came from. <laughs> and it was like a legal defense. So you could say, no, 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 he's running amok. So we're not going to prosecute him for all the people he killed when he was running amok or something weird. I'm half remembering a story. That's not what you are here for. You're here for me to read Callum's fine words and then for Jen. Too well. well, if you're watching this, you get some images. If you're listening to this, you get some sounds, obviously. Let's just jump into it, shall we? Fact and fiction often overlap in true crime. Hearsay becomes conspiracy theory, which collides with witness testimony, which puts a spin on hard evidence. That's a very nice sentence, Callum. Brilliant start. <laughs> Thank you. And somewhere buried deep under all those layers is some obscure little thing called truth. In today's case, that evasive end goal was even more fickle than usual. After writing a violent, taboo-filled debut, a young Polish novelist found himself accused of murder. Generally, writing a book about violence doesn't necessarily make you a criminal. I'm pretty sure Dostoevsky never smashed anyone's head in, and as far as we know, Agatha Christie never slashed anyone up on a train. <laughs> I have to say, I have such an appalling knowledge of pop culture that I saw, and spoiler alert for the Orient Express, which is, I don't know, 100 years old, so I don't think you have to do a spoiler alert for that. Is it 100 years old? Again, my lack of knowledge is extraordinary. I saw that fairly average remake of Murder on the Orient Express a few years ago. Genuinely didn't know the ending. When it turned out that they were all the people, when they were all responsible for the murder, I was like, whoa, that is a great ending. <laughs> That's slightly embarrassing to admit. But for the lead detective on this case, this particular book was more than a simple work of fiction. Certain details made it seem like it might be an elaborate, creative confession to a crime that went cold years ago. <laughs> if you're new to the Casual Criminalist, welcome. And let me introduce you to an ongoing meme. The criminals who write down their crimes. Because, oh boy, does this come up time and time again. I swear the last episode I recorded was about a Dutch uh, novelist who ended up writing a book about his wife's murder which actually happened and then he went to prison it's like my dudes stop writing down your crimes actually this morning i was working on the design of a, a first merch item here on the casual criminals which isn't released yet so don't get too excited um it's a notebook 
and on the front it says definitely not my crimes it wasn't my idea someone uh, i think hit me up on twitter with this um, several people in fact and so i was like let's do it so it's coming soon it's not ready yet soon i don't even have a website yet so i'll just tell you when it's out all right chapter one an unhappy homecoming once upon a time, in September 2005, to be a bit more precise, globe-trotting intellectual Christian Bala flew back to his home country of Poland to visit family. Still in his early 30s, Bala spent most of his time traveling around the world teaching scuba diving to fund his true passion, writing philosophical fiction. Well, there's one thing about him, he doesn't sound boring. <laughs> so what are you up to? Not long after he touched down in Poland, the young novelist was accosted by a group of his biggest fans. But these readers weren't looking for an autograph. As Bala left a pharmacy in his hometown, Choi now, he was set upon by a group of four thugs. One of them got him in a chokehold, and another twisted his arms up behind his back so hard that he thought he would they would snap, clapping on a pair of handcuffs. The men then tossed him into the back of a car and told him to lie down on the floor. What has this scuba teaching philosophy writing dude done to upset this gang at the end like where someone's waiting for you at an airport and if they're not your family it's not a good sign is it generally it's like we've been waiting for you you're in big trouble get in the back of this van the men then tossed him into the back of the car and told him to lie down on the floor as the car sped off one of the men slipped a plastic bag over his head and punched christian in the gut whenever he tried to speak number of times i've tried to speak after getting punched in the gut once well one more time and then I get punched in the gut again, then I am silent because <laughs> I don't want to get punched in the gut again. Especially your hands tied around your back. You can't do anything about it. He could hear their leader speaking on the phone saying, Hi boss, we've got the dead. Yes, he's alive. So now what? At meeting point? Bala knew he was being kidnapped. The men probably thought he was loaded on account of his budding writing career. <laughs> yes, authors. Famous for being wealthy. But they had severely overestimated how lucrative the writing profession is. Bala only just made enough to fund his travels, never mind paying a ransom. The car pulled to a stop after a few minutes, and Bala heard them discussing him, killing him then and there in the woods. Also, like, philosophers are also, like, not exactly lucrative profession, is it? Uh, but rather than dump him in an unmarked grave, the kidnappers continued on. The next time the car stopped, he was dragged into a building, and when the suffocating plastic bag was finally taken off, Bala found himself in a damp little concrete room. Over the next few hours, he was forced to strip down, was beaten mercilessly, and denied food. The kidnappers told him that if he, denied, if he declined to cooperate, he was a dead man. Then, after enough violent theatrics to soften the writer up nicely, a new man came into the room, middle-aged, balding with a stern glare, fixed on the terrified man in front of him. The visitor sat down across from Bala at the small metal table and introduced himself. My name is Detective Robluski and I'd like to ask you a few questions. I got some questions right now. Like, if I'm this Bala dude, and I've been kidnapped and beaten up, and then a detective walks into the room, my immediate thought is, oh, thank God, it's the police. The worst that's gonna happen to me now is I'm gonna go to prison for something. Although, you've just been kidnapped and beaten up, which is, like, also implies that the police are not exactly playing by the rules, are they? <laughs> and like, hey, boss, that sounds like you're involved with crooked police, which then immediately makes it worse again. So that sucks. A cold morning by the river Oda. Apparently arrests are pretty hardcore in Poland. No shit. Nothing gets the suspect talking like the threat of being executed and buried in the forest. To understand why poor Christian Bala found himself face to face with the detective that day in 2005, we have to jump back half a decade to the year 2000. On November the 13th of that year, a man named Darius Yas, oh my god, these Polish names, Januszewski left the offices of his small advertising firm in the Polish city of Wroclaw, or Roklaw is, is Wroclaw, right? Oh my god, I've actually been there, just a few hours from the Czech and German borders to meet a client. Nothing seemed to miss as the receptionist watched him walk out of the door at around 4pm, turning down the street towards the car park. But somewhere between the office door and the car, Darius went missing. His car was still in the parking lot at closing time, despite the fact that he never returned to the office. Even stranger, he never returned home either. Yeah, well, if he just went home, they'd be like, well, he just left work early, didn't he? And that would be the end of the story. The fact that he didn't have to go home is like way more suspicious. Although leaving his work car at work is also suspicious, but maybe he had a beer with lunch and couldn't drive. <laughs> I don't know. It's, like, it's, it's way more reasonable if he's at home. You just ask him, what happened, Darius? Why are you here? Why are you not at work? Maybe he got hypnotized and doesn't have to worry about his job anymore. 
1999 movie reference right there. I'm not sure what's going on with me. I'm also super curious as what's this got to do with Christian, right? Because this is Darius. What's Darius up to? Anyway. His wife waited for him late into the night, ringing his cell phone over and over, but Darius never picked up. It was unlike him to take off without telling anyone, especially since the business needed him. Even if he'd met an old friend and went off for a drink, he would leave a text. So early the next morning, she reported him missing to the police. It was a long four weeks before any trace of Darius was found. In December, three friends were out fishing on our own. No, he's dead. It's like, if, he, if you're found by fishermen... You're not alive. Uh, at a remote stretch of the Oda River, not far from the city, when they saw something floating in the water. At first they thought it was part of a tree, but as they got closer, they saw sodden clothing draped over the mass. One of them reached out and poked at it with his fishing rod, and it rolled over. And as it rolled over slightly, they realized it was the corpse of a man. The police removed the partly decayed remains from the water and noted that the guy was a physical match for the missing businessman, and his mother later confirmed it. Accidental death was quickly ruled out, unless Januszewski had somehow managed to tie a noose around his own neck and tie his hands behind his back. Let's just say, I think we've done enough, ca enough casual criminals to say that that is unlikely. Or there wasn't that that dude... No, I mean, people hang themselves, right? They just don't hang themselves with their hands behind their backs. Wasn't that famous guy who accidentally killed himself? And it seemed like he was definitely up to some... He, he didn't want to commit suicide. He was just into autoerotic asphyxiation and died. I don't remember who it was, but he was pretty famous, right? Anyway, I mean, let's just throw in an allegedly there, in case that is alleged. I mean, he's dead. It's not like he's going to sue me, but someone might, allegedly. Uh, and judging by the frayed ends of the ropes, it was clear that his arms were originally tied to the noose, meaning that he would have strangled himself to death the more he struggled against his captor. Not the nicest way to go. No, <laughs> definitely not. The only clothing left on him was his underwear and a sweater, meaning he was probably stripped down to humiliate him. Similarly, the lack of food in his intestines suggested he had been starved for days before the execution. And worst of all, all post-mortem analysis showed that the drowning that drowning may have been the cause of death. That would mean he was tossed into the frigid waters while still alive. That is uh, just generally uh, pr pretty horrible, to be honest. Now the missing person case had officially been upgraded to a murder, so the cops began looking for a motive. But the deceased was a pretty normal guy. Mar man had no enemies, no debts, and although his marriage had some rocky patches, he and his wife of eight years had been planning to adopt a child when he went missing. On paper, it seems like nobody in the world had any reason to kill Januszewski. And so now it comes down to, well, he's got some secret life, or big, scary gang secret, or he's uh, just been mistaken for someone else. And the fact that we brought in this Christian guy, maybe it's a case of mistaken identity or some such. Who knows? Perhaps a robbery then. Nah, I, Callum speculation, perhaps a robbery. It seems way too, like, personal and gangy. Like, who starves someone to death for days if it's a robbery and then throws them in a river? That's just doesn't seem likely. People knew that the man owned his own company, so he must have had a bit of cash in his pocket. If money were the motive, though, surely there would have been some activity on the man's credit cards after he was killed. Otherwise, the killers only would have walked away with a handful of zloty that was in his pocket. But the credit cards were never used. In fact, the only lead the police had on the whole thing were a pair of phone calls made from the anonymous client that the murdered man was on his way to meet that day. The mother, who worked as an accounting clerk at the firm, received a call at 9.30 a.m. that morning. The guy on the other end of the line sounded official sophisticated even. He inquired about the rates for printing posters and then asked to speak to Januszewski directly. The boss was yet to arrive, so his mother passed on his mobile phone number to the caller and left it at that. When Januszewski made it into the office later that day, he confirmed that the same man had called him and they'd arranged to meet later that day. It seems like the businessman had managed to meet his anonymous client that day, but apparently they weren't very interested in buying posters. There was one witness who might have actually caught a glimpse of these kidnappers on the day of the incident the receptionist. She had never thought anything of it at the time, but as Januszewski walked out of the door and turned down the street, she saw two men coming toward the pavement behind him. In retrospect, she thought they might have been in intentionally tailing him, but she couldn't give an accurate description of them, so the lead ran into a dead end. And with it died the investigation. Whoever had killed Darius Januszewski had pulled off the perfect crime. Not a shred of physical evidence in sight and no further witnesses to identify them. The family hung a wooden cross on a tree near where the man's body was found and tried to move on with their lives. Oh, that's got to be so hard. Like, I mean, obviously, someone close to you dying is bad. Someone close to you being murdered is worse. And then not having any, like, closure or solving that has got to be pretty terrible. The only worst thing I can imagine is, like, someone just disappearing. Like, and then just not knowing for years is going to be, like, absolutely horrible. Like, I, I think of... 
that Madeline McCann case in the UK and how terrible that would be for the parents, like the, the little girl who went missing. And now that I have my own kid, I'm like, oh my God, this would destroy me. Anyway, that would have probably been the closing chapter in the story, except we've got about 200 pages left, Callum. <laughs> Had the cold case not found its way onto the desk of a particularly determined detective almost three years later. Tracking the phone. Enter our old school cop, the guy who rocked up at the end of the fake kidnapping earlier on, Detective Yatek Roblevsky. I'm sorry, Polish people, this time it's not that hard. You just say the W like a V and the J like a Y. Uh, I know, but it's hard. He and his team of detectives at uh, Wroclaw Police HQ received Januszewski's case file in autumn 2003, still with no leads, no suspects, and no hope in heaven of ever cracking it. As is always the first step with these dead cases, their job began with trudging through every minor detail in the file, looking for any angle that hadn't been explored so far. After a few long evenings spent obsessing over the case, he decided that the, that the phone calls were the key. The department telecom had already worked out that the calls that were made to the victim's office and cell phone both came from a payphone on the same street, less than a minute's walk from the office itself. This meant that the kidnappers had been staking out the building since morning, probably planning on snatching Januszewski earlier in the day. There weren't any cameras facing the phone book, so Wroblewski instead focused on the victim's own phone. Just like his credit cards, the records showed it was never used after his disappearance. But that wasn't the only way to trace a phone. If the detective could only find out the serial number, he would be able to check it against the ledgers of pawn shops and resale websites. By a stroke of luck, the widow had kept the receipt, which did indeed show the serial number. Just like that, Detective Roblovsky managed- Can we just call him Detective W? I'm just going to call him Detective W from now on because it's going to be easier on me. And if anyone who is Polish is listening, it's probably going to be less horribly grating on your ears. So, Detective W managed to wrench a fresh lead out of the case that seemed long past its sell-by date. The mobile phone had been sold on a website called Allegro Polish eBay four days after the victim disappeared. My dude. What are you up to if you're selling the victim's phone? <laughs> like, that doesn't seem like the brightest move. And despite pulling off an otherwise perfect crime, yet you're not leaving any trace evidence whatsoever. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll sell that phone online. <laughs> it's like, that won't leave a digital trail whatsoever. Uh, it appeared as if the killer had, had left a bit of a glaring exposition right there on his seller's profile the username Chris B. A bit of digging into the background of this digital identity revealed that Chris B was the anglicized pseudonym of one Christian Barler. Ah, this is our connection, a 32-year-old man from Bratislav. But Christian didn't exactly seem like the killing type. A slim, perspective called philosophy student with a love of literature, he probably didn't have the will or physical capability to murder the much larger victim. Bala hardly fit the profile of your average gangster or robber either. He was highly educated, graduating near the, graduating near the top of his class at the University of Wroclaw, and was even once set to get his PhD. Bala was forced to quit the academic path in 1997 since he didn't have the funds to support himself, his high school girlfriend turned wife Stasha, and his newborn son Casper. The detective thought there must be some explanation, a simple case of mistaken identity. Perhaps Bala picked up the phone from the street and saw a chance to make a bit of beer money by selling it on. After all, who would be stupid enough to kill a man and sell his phone online using his real name? Certainly not someone with Bala's IQ. Or maybe, I mean, you also get that high IQ arrogance thing where it's like, yeah, I'm unstoppable, they'll never put it together despite it being extremely easy put to put together, although it did take several years and a whole new detective just to be interested in it. So if this was actually him, which I think it might be because he seems to be the main character today, um, yeah, I mean, he, he was kind of kind of right for a long time. Uh, detective W prepared to contact Bala for a statement, which was a little difficult seeing as he was already living overseas in Asia by this point after separating from his wife some years ago. I, I, I've i had one contact with the police uh, in the UK and <laughs> in general. I once bought, I bought a, uh, <laughs> strangely enough, such a similar story. I bought a drone, like, you know, one of those photography drones off eBay UK. This was back when the UK was in the European Union, so you could post without customs being a huge hassle. And uh, it arrived and it was broken. So I returned it. I, I attempted to contact the seller and return it. 
And the, the seller never got back to me. So eventually eBay were like, yeah, he's not responding. So we'll, you know, we'll take the money from his account and give it to you. And then a few months later, I get an email from the police <laughs> being like, hey, did you buy this drone? And I was like, oh God, am I in trouble? Like for stealing this drone or something? Because I still had the drone. I couldn't, I couldn't send it back to him. He didn't pay for postage or anything. eBay just gave me the money. I'm like, oh my God, am I in trouble for this? Did I, did I do a crime? And so I replied to the beast, I'm like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, it turns out this guy had stolen a whole bunch of drones. The guy who sold it to me had stolen a whole bunch of drones and basically sold them. So they were trying to recover this stolen property. And I was like, yo, I don't live in the UK. If you want to pay postage, police, (laughs) I'm going to, I can send it back to you. But otherwise, uh, because you're just going to send this to an insurance company. Uh, come get it <laughs> and they were like yeah uh that's a bit of a hassle don't worry about it <laughs> but they're like can you hold on to it this was five years ago i still have that stolen drone that a guy was you know gonna use to uh out and he was stealing the drones so he could fly drugs into prisons because i googled him and that's what he went to jail for and i was like that is pretty intense side story over in the meantime, they kept gathering details on his character just in case he turned out to be a genuine suspect. That's when Detective W made the discovery that changed his mind on the man entirely, something that suggested there was a, st- a secret dark side to this highly educated philosopher. As I mentioned before, Bala actually belonged to a group of detestable egomaniacs famous for their moral depravity. He was a writer. <laughs> a little bit of self-deprecation there, Callan. Nice. Running amok. That's right, earlier that same year, Christy Bala fulfilled a lifelong dream and became a published author. The novel, written in his native Polish, was titled Amok, and it served as a bit of a manifesto for the niche postmodernist views he developed in the Wroclaw University philosophy department. I don't just mean some obnoxious views on art. Amok goes a little bit further than that. The book is about one man's descent into a spree of increasing depravity sex, violence, drugs, all that good stuff in the belief that he's above morality. That little blurb doesn't exactly pique my interest, but it was very interesting to Detective W. He had just discovered that a man adjacent to this violent murder case had written extensively about violent murder. (laughs) Ah, you wrote down your crimes! Come on! Hoping it might provide a bit of a character reference for his current number one suspect, the detective decided to switch out the case file for a copy. It wouldn't have been an easy book to get a hold of since Poland is a pretty conservative Catholic country. This sort of taboo anti-church stuff, with a devilish goat's head on the front cover no less, wasn't stocked in many mainstream stores. The detective managed to find one. I mean, just go online. <laughs> just go to Amazon.pl. I don't even know if that exists, but it probably does probably tucked away on a top shelf among the porn magazines and started can you imagine how disappointed you'd be it's like oh yeah i'm gonna get some pornography and instead you ended up with a goat's head book about murder ah, god damn it also who goes to a sh- it's 2005 isn't it guys oh no is it the late 90s or 2005 because i don't you know <laughs> pornography changed but importantly with the advent of the internet And he started combing through this book to see exactly what kind of mind he was dealing with. His colleagues thought that the detective had gone a bit mad, or a bit soft, or both. Was he really hoping to solve a murder case by reading a book like some kind of posh boy? (laughs) Hi, you're gonna solve that with a book, Detective W? You idiot! You can read? Ha! Most of us insufferable literature grads would agree characters don't represent their writers. But the more he reads, the more adamant Detective W became. Inside the pages of a mock were some clues that Christian Bala might be more like a sadistic anti-hero than he let on in everyday life. Here's a little brief synopsis of what his book was all about. A hedonistic translator called Chris travels between Mexico and Paris, sleeping with women, drinking with his group of nihilistic mates, and fantasizing about sexual violence. When I say sexual violence, I'm not talking soft Fifty Shades of Grey level stuff. A mock features a passage where the narrator fantasizes about sexually assaulting his own mother. Oh my. Now might be a good time to mention that Barlow gave a signed copy to his parents when it was published. That must have been a very uncomfortable Christmas. (laughs) Oh my god, yes. Also, did you name the main character after yourself? (laughs) It's not... (laughs) What are you up to? In the end, the anti-hero murders Mary, one of his girlfriends, and this is the part that really set the detective's alarm bells ringing. When he does this, he ties a noose around her neck. 
Bala himself was certain that his book would one day be seen as a great work of literature, but honestly, it just sounds like standard shock porn dross. That kind of thing hardly raises an eyebrow in many places these days, but in conservative Poland, it was pretty scandalous. Predictably, it didn't sell very well and received mixed reviews at best from the press. Even Bala's mates and all professors thought that it was a bit rubbish. <laughs> What's what? Yeah, when your mates are telling you that your book's rubbish, you know your book is rubbish. <laughs> What's more, it didn't do the intelligent, funny, popular guy that they had known all these years justice. Where they saw a good mate who wouldn't hurt a fly, the few people who read a mock saw a twisted monster. On Bala's personal website, where he also published excerpts from the book and chatted on, in the persona of his characters, people left comments calling him a misogynistic psycho. Bear in mind, this was three years before Twitter, so online abuse hadn't quite fully been normalized yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was coming. One of his female friends even had a confrontation with him in the comments section, saying that the narrator's twisted thoughts must have come from his own mind. Well, obviously they did. He's the author of the piece. Just, uh, I guess she's implying that they're very, you know... It's like, what are you hiding under that facade there, friend? <laughs> Sabala himself was clearly quite depraved in his typical condescending way. He said that these accusations were ridiculous. Quote, A simple reader will find interesting only a few violent scenes with a graphic description of people having sex. But if someone really looks, he will see that these scenes are intended to awaken the reader and show how f***ed up and impoverished and hypocritical this world is. But Detective W was no simple reader. And he went one further than the rest of the critics. He not only suspected that Bala was as depraved of his ca as his characters, but also that the events in a mock weren't really as fictional as he claimed. This guy sounds like with this kind of like slightly violent book where he's trying to make a statement. He sounds kind of like a version of Bretty Stanellis, except like Bretty Stanellis succeeds in his social commentary, whereas this guy just <laughs> seems not to not to at all. He made the novel compulsory reading for all the detectives in his team, turning the squad of hard-boiled Slavic cops into a soft-boiled book club, although the books they're reading are not soft-boiled. Each detective was assigned characters chapters to analyze for any similarities, this is great, between the lives of the main character and Christian Bala. Now, it definitely is true that authors do often insert their own lives into their work. That's why my debut follows the adventures of a top content writer who cyberbullies serial killers so much that the FBI hire him as a top profiler. Oh no, Callum, don't, don't get hired away from me by the FBI. I need you. But not all author, although that would be also cool. You could go work for the FBI. You'd have some great stories. This would be great. <laughs> but not all author inser insertions are as straightforwardly honest as mine. And just because a guy wrote about a sadistic, nihilistic murderer doesn't make him one. With that disclaimer out of the way, here are the reasons that this particular writer probably was a sadistic, nihilistic murderer. I'm just going to throw in an allegedly there, <laughs> just in case. On the surface level, Chris and Christian, uh, uh, by the way, just because you can't see this, Chris, the character, is spelt with a C, and Christian, the man, is spelt with a K. They're very much the same person. They both were separated from their wives, drank too much, and had some minor brushes with the law. In the book, Chris and his mate got drunk and steal an idol of St. Anthony from a church. Blur the whole Bala's criminal record revealed that he and his friend had been arrested for the exact same thing after a night of drinking years ago. So far, nothing particularly incriminating, unless we're just charging him with blasphemy. Uh, Poland's pretty conservative. I wonder if blasphemy is actually a crime in Poland. <laughs> it's, ridiculous. it's probably not, right? You can't be... You can't. You, you can't. Come on. But some details in the novel went beyond all that and seemed to reference the murder of Darius Januszewski directly. For example, the noose around the neck mirrored what happened to the real-life murdered man. In the novel, Chris talks about how he struggled to tie the knot. Was this perhaps drawn from Bala's personal experience with Januszewski? That might seem like a bit of a leap until you hear this. It was later discovered that, Jan that Bala's search history on Polish eBay included a police manual titled Accidental, Suicidal, or Criminal Hanging. Sounds like a real page-turner. Bala never ended up purchasing the book, but it at least proves that he was in the market for that information. Yeah, this is one of those things, though. If you're an author, right, and you're writing a book about murder, your search history is going to be intense. Or, like... If you're writing a book about terrorism, you're definitely going to end up on some watch list somehow. And then I'd think, just use a VPN. But I'm like, I don't know. Even then, I'll be like, I don't want to search like about terrorism. <laughs> it's, it's knock, 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 FBI. 
Another little detail was fra- flagged up by Wroclaw's finest literary detectives. There are actually two murders mentioned in a mock. The narrator Chris claims to have killed a man before due to a fit of jealous rage. Barla's business was going under at the time, while the victim was thriving. Could that have been enough to make him murderously jealous? I mean, for any normal person, no. <laughs> for this psycho, maybe yes. Detective W knew that all of this seemed pretty thin. When your colleagues are off beating down gangsters and raiding drug dens, weekly book reports don't do much for your reputation. And everything so far could be explained away by the fact that the details of the case were public. Barla could easily have lifted the details right off the front page of the Wroclaw paper, but there was one key detail in the book that convinced the detective that he was on the right track. In the murder scene, Barla wrote, I tightened the noose around her neck, holding her down with one hand. With my other hand, I stabbed the knife below her left breast. Is there going to be something that he says in there, like some detail there that's not going to be made public? Because that's how they often get them. Or if they know if the like letters from the killers are real, it's like if they mention them some detail that's not public, some detail the police have intentionally kept quiet. The murder weapon he's talking about is a ceremonial Japanese knife. Barlow then has his character sell that same knife a few days after the killing on an internet auction site. If you recall, the fact that the murdered man's phone was sold after his death was only discovered years later, after Barlow's novel was published. That meant there was no way that he could have borrowed that little detail from the police reports. He must have borrowed it from real life. Yeah, but selling the knife is not selling the phone. The knife's the murder weapon. The phone is just part of the overall it's just the victim's phone again i mean yes i do think this guy probably killed him allegedly but uh do i think it beyond all reasonable doubt that it would that it would be convicted in a court of law no it's really circumstantial to detective w and his men it was now clear that a mock wasn't just a work of imagination but one big extended cryptic murder confession He's one of these guys who thinks he's so smart that he can get away with it. I hope he gets sent to prison. An absurd matter. Which brings us back to 2005. By then, Christian and his wife were fully separated, thanks to his dual love of drinking and brothel diving. Yes, not brilliant for a relationship. His business was also bust, and he was gallivanting around Japan, Korea, and America, publishing the odd travel article to make ends meet. That meant that the police couldn't risk letting word get out about their suspicions, or Barla might never return to Poland and live a life on the lam instead. They had to wait for him to return home willfully. Why don't, isn't there like isn't this what Interpol does? The guy's a murderer. <laughs> Allegedly, potentially. Can't they just be like, yo, 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 when he goes through an airport, because he's obviously got to go through airports or ports to get to these different countries. Just be like, yo, mate, your passport is getting confiscated and you're going to sit in this back room and then we're going to put you on a plane back to Poland and you're going to have a bad time. Isn't that what international police do? Isn't that the whole point? I mean, it's not like these countries are not going to, like, America is definitely going to have some sort of extradition policy with Poland, right? They had to wait for him to return home willingly. It was a matter of watching and waiting. Made worthwhile when Bala made a routine trip back at the end of summer that year. Within a week of his arrival, Detective Roblovsky and his, sorry, Detective W and his team intercepted the author as he walked out of a pharmacy in Chonau. Now, you've already heard Bala's side of the story, but to hear Detective W tell it, it was perfectly it was a perfectly civil arrest. Balo was picked up on the street and peacefully taken to Vratslav Police HQ for questioning. If you're not sure who to believe, now would be a good time to mention that Balo was well known for making up tall tales. Yeah, he's also the criminal, and like I definitely believe that police violence is a thing. Absolutely, no doubt. But also, it, this was just the guy who got arrested, being like, yeah, they beat me up. Because maybe that'll help you out in court later. I don't know. Like police misconduct during investigation. Does that get people off? I don't know. His, te- his friends testified that he loved turning his everyday life into fiction. Apparently, he often came to them with stories about flings that never happened or made up accomplishments. He loved to brag about how he was above a normal existence and capable of anything. If any- <laughs> it's capable of anything. I could do anything including murder. Uh, Eventually, it was impossible to tell which of his boasts were fake and which were true. While most people call it being an irritating bullshit, this philosophy grad preferred to call it uh, mytho-creativity. You may roll your eyes now. (laughs) Mytho-creativity. Yes. No, you're an annoying shitter, mate. What this basically meant was that Christian enjoyed making up little stories and seeing how many people he could convince to believe them. After his arrest in 2005, he put those powers to work on a gargantuan scale. 
After being released from custody, Bala started spinning a story to counter the one the police had worked on for the past two years. Dude, they've been working on it for a really long time. <laughs> You're in trouble. He sent out letters to academic institutions and typed up posts on his personal blog complaining about how he was being persecuted by the establishment simply for writing a blasphemous novel. Since Poland was still under a repressive com communist regime a little over a decade prior, its artists were no stranger to iron-fisted censorship. That may be at least partly why creative why the creative community rallied around Bala. Are they going to re regret that, assuming this guy is actually guilty of murder, right? His American girlfriend, Denise Reinhardt, took uh, his cause, cause global, setting up a defense committee to fight for his freedom. They named the case Sprora Absurd, the absurd murder, and carpet bombed the Justice Department with letters defending his right to artistic expression. Yeah, of course, he has a right to artistic expression. They're not it's got nothing to do with that. It's to do with the fact that he's been investigated for a murder. The cops try to explain, No, 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 this isn't some literary witch hunt people. He has literally killed a guy. But the tide was turning for Detective W. Two years of hard work going down the drain. His original plan hinged on getting a confession, but the interview at the station hadn't gone as well as he'd hoped. To prove he really had nothing to hide, Bala had consented to a polygraph test. Detective W quizzed him on the victim. He said he never knew him. The day of the kidnapping, he was working, and the phone, he couldn't remember where he got it. Although the results were inconclusive, Detective W <laughs> I mean, wait, hang on. He couldn't remember where he got the phone that he sold? It's not it what it was two years ago. How do you not remember that? Like how how? <laughs> how? You, might, you, you could say you found it somewhere at least. Although the results were inconclusive, Detective W sensed Bala was hiding the truth. His breathing seemed to slow during certain questions as if he was trying to cheat the test. As a qualified scuba instructor, he would be well aware of how to pull that off. Wait, qualified scuba instructors are also briefed on like how to cheat lie detectors? I guess it's more like they know about breathing and, and I get I don't know. <laughs> For now, it was Bala 1, Detective W0. The only things the writer was charged with that day were selling a, sol selling a stolen phone and an unrelated bribery charge from years ago. <laughs> okay, <laughs> who are you bribing? He was released after the 48-hour window to add further charges expired. From there, Bala and his buddies managed to control the narrative. He himself wrote to his supporters, They have ruined my family life. We will never talk loud at home again. We will never use the internet freely again. We will never make any phone calls not thinking about who is listening. Every single bark of our little dog alerts us, and we don't know what or who to expect. It's a terror. Quiet terror. But while he was busy playing the persecuted genius, Detective W went back to the drawing board with more determination than ever to scrape away all the layers of fiction and reveal the truth about what Bala really did to Darius Januszewski all those years ago. And no matter how good a storyteller Christian Bala was, the cold, hard facts told a more compelling narrative. The Final Missing Pieces After Bala was released from custody, the department's telecoms team made another key discovery. The calls made to the murder's man, murdered man's office of mobile were not made using coins but a prepaid phone card. By digging around in the card issuer's records, they managed to get its number and the call logs attached in the weeks surrounding the murder. The same card was used to make dozens of calls, all of them to Bala's friends, business, wife, and family. Oh, and there we have it. That is, I mean selling the guy's phone, making the call. Also, this is so dumb. I mean, you're making the call from a pay phone, so it can't be traced. But you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll use my prepaid card, which is clearly associated with me. And I guess they just keep these records for it. I'll be like, after a few years, you'll be like, yeah, probably not. They don't have those records. And it's like, no, no, no. This is the digital world. They may as well hold on to them. And yeah, it's, dude, it's pretty stupid to use that, to be honest. And but this is like, this is, this is it, right? This is the... That's the nail in the coffin. Piles upon piles of circumstantial evidence are great. I mean, that is locking it down, though, isn't it? But they wouldn't amount to much without the last piece of the puzzle, a motive. And what motive could Bala possibly have for killing a man he had no dealings with in the past? Because he's crazy. He's like, I'm above the law. He just wants to kill someone. Like that Murder by Numbers movie, which isn't very good. But it's like, why are we killing someone? Just because we want to see what it's like. It's like, this guy's that crazy, you know, thinks he's above everyone, bullshit. 
The brutality of it suggested that the killer had an axe to grind. Yana Zuski had been tortured and humiliated, meaning his killer got pleasure out of watching the suffering. The detective had a criminal profile to do an analysis on the fictional killer Chris. They suggested that this character, a flagrant homophobe, might have been driven to murder and mayhem by his own repressed homosexuality. That gave rise to the theory that the real-life suspect and victim had been having a secret relationship which turned sour, but there was no evidence to back this up. That does seem like a bit of a stretch doesn't it? They were generally on the right track. Oh, they were, okay. Uh, Detective W kept returning time and time again to the very last line of the novel, a cryptic answer to an even more cryptic riddle. This was the one killed by blind jealousy. Whenever jealousy comes up in a murder case, you usually have to start looking towards romantic partners. To hear Bala tell it, he had plenty of these, but there was only one he ever spent more than a few weeks or months with, his estranged wife, Stasha. Detective W decided to focus again on the wife, who had up to this point refused to cooperate with the investigation. He wanted to paint a picture of what their relationship looked like at the time of the murder. Interviews with Bala's buds revealed that these were some of the most tumultuous in their marriage. At the time, Bala was on the verge of losing the small industrial cleaning business he founded after dropping out of university. That is a... That, I, is this the first time we mentioned what his business was? I know it was failing, but like that is a change from like... I mean, what are you going to do? I'm going to pursue a PhD in philosophy. And he left that to start a cleaning business. Very strange. And his alcoholism was worse than ever. One of Stash's friends called him an authoritarian type for the way he aggressively dominated her life. This led to their separation earlier in the year, but that wasn't enough to put him off. Barlow would go drinking for days on end and show up at Stash's door, shouting abuse and demanding to look through her phone. There's that blind jealousy that he wrote about. Then on New Year's Eve 2000, Stasher and Christian ended up at the same party thrown by one of their shared friends. Things took a turn late in the night when Bala tried to swing at a barman who'd, accu who'd hit accused of chatting up his wife. Wait, weren't they separated? <laughs> one witness heard him tell the barman, I've already dealt with such a guy. Nobody knew what it meant apart from Butler himself. Yet Yana Suski's body had been found just two weeks prior. Ah, so maybe he was having something with his ex-wife. And there we go. That makes perfect sense. Oh, if we get this motivation, this guy is going down. Which will be awesome because he sounds like a total bellend. Following the trail, they started questioning the other partygoers from that evening. One of them was a woman na named Malgorzata Drozdal, a longtime friend of Stasha. As it turns out, she should have been indicted on firearms charges because she had been holding on to the smoking gun this entire time. Oh, nice play. Ba -da -ba -bum Her testimony made up the crucial missing chapter in the murder manuscript that the police had been drafting all these years. I just want to jump in and say how much of a good time I'm having with this mystery. Like, this is one of my favorite ones so far. I like that the guy's a d I like that we're closing in on him. I'm enjoying this one a great deal. Jumping back again very slightly to a night in autumn of 2000, we're heading to a Wroclaw nightclub called The Crazy Horse. That's where Malgozata and Stasha, although all these Polish names are very difficult, went out for a night together to help forget about the separation from her domineering husband. After a few drinks, the two women ended up getting separated. When Malgo eventually found her friend, she saw her chatting with a man at the bar, a tall guy with dark hair and blue eyes. Stasher's handsome new friends went by the name Darius. He and Stasher exchanged numbers before closing time and agreed to go on a date together later that week. There was the piece of evidence the police had been searching for all along. The thread that finally collected, connected the suspect and the victim, who had otherwise never crossed paths. The cops brought this new information to Stasha. Now facing the prospect that her ex-husband, the father of her child, was almost definitely guilty, she finally opened up. Why would you not... I guess uh, you, uh, you don't want to be like, you know, drifting toward... I, I'm aware of drifting towards victim blaming here because, like, I guess, you know, he was very domineering. She's probably a little bit afraid of him. So she doesn't want to come forward and, like, testify against him or make give evidence against him or whatever you call it. So I don't want to blame her. But it is like... I mean, you know the guy was murdered... You know the guy who was murdered, and the suspect is your husband, and you're just keeping mum? I mean, why would you keep... You're separated. And he seems like a bad person who you don't like. But I guess I think probably it's got something... She's probably afraid of him or something. Don't want to blame her, but she should have come forward. <laughs> Yeah, she and Darius Yaranzuski had gone on a date together that week. Afterwards, they even checked into a hotel, but when she found out he was married, she ducked out for the sake of her conscience, or perhaps this was also a little bit of a fiction to spare the murder man's widow the heartbreak. Even though nothing came of it, Bala somehow still caught wind of the aborted affair. 
A couple of weeks after the date, he knocked on Stash's door drunk and screaming, as per. He told her that he knew everything, and he had hired a PI to follow her, and they reported every detail down to the exact room number she and Januszewski had checked into. When the man went missing later that year, Stasher asked Bella if he knew anything about it, and he said no. Wait, he waited like months to pursue this? Dude, that is... <laughs> Alright, I mean, that, why am I surprised that he's crazy? Why? <laughs> For years, there was no reason to think otherwise. Sure, Bala was a dick, but surely not a murdering dick. Now, though, the case against him was becoming increasingly clear. Stash's illusions of the man she once loved were well and truly shattered. Same with all those furious literati who had come out to defend Bala to the death after his arrest. There were more than a few red faces when Bala's house was raided, and he was finally charged with the abduction and murder of Darius Januszewski. Finally! And now we move on to the trial. And we've only got a few pages left, so I hope it was a short trial in which he's convicted and sentenced to death. Not really. It's, I, don't, I don't think they're... No. Po oh, back in the day, when did Poland get rid of the death? But you can't have the death penalty if you're in the EU. So we know they don't have it today, and I get the feeling they didn't have it for a very long time. He's going to prison forever. At least let's hope. The Trial Sat in a caged-off section in Wroclaw courtroom on February the 2nd, 22nd, 2007, our philosopher-turned-murderer waited nervously for his trial to begin. The story of a postmodern killer openly boasting about his crimes through his work was too good to ignore, so the place was packed as the trial kicked off. Butler himself looked more like a university professor about to start a lecture than a killer facing 25 years behind bars. The prosecution's goal was to display that Christian Barlow was pretty much one and the same as his fictional counterpart, a hedonistic sadist who got off on his own philosophically justified immorality. Didn't he also say in the book that he killed someone before? Should Can we find... We Did they look into that other murder? Potential murder? Alleged murder? On the other hand, the defense argued that all the evidence against him was circumstantial, which was true, but there was a lot of it. Yeah, I mean, dude, you just look at it. If that's your case as the prosecuting attorney, that's going to be strong, my dudes. All of the signs pointed to Bala hovering around the victim in the days surrounding his disappearance, and he had no justification for any of it. The evidence gleaned from a mark was really just the cherry on the cake. When the accused got his chance to question each of the witnesses himself, he was about as irritating as you'd imagine. One ex-girlfriend testified that he once got drunk and threatened to commit suicide by jumping off the balcony. His response, could we just say that this is a matter of semantics, a misuse of the word suicide? No, Christian, this is a courtroom, not an undergrad seminar. Yeah, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? The jury were about as impressed as Bal by Bala's defense as the book reviewers were with his novel. 1.5 stars. Would not recommend. So in the end, he was found guilty and sentenced to the maximum punishment amount available under the law, 25 years. Excellent. That meant he would have plenty of time to ponder over the semantics from the comfort of a Wroclaw prison cell. The Difficult Second Novel When the New Yorker's David Grand went to visit Bala at that dismal Soviet-era prison back in 2008, he found that the writer's massive ego had only grown bigger after his conviction. Still obsessed with his own novel, he was even in the habit of reading it out loud to his cellmates, which is definitely how you get shanked. <laughs> Worst of all, he still refused to accept the objective reality of what he had done. In his own eyes, Bala remained a tortured genius, targeted by the state for refusing to abide by their Christian morals. Now, nah, mate, you murdered someone, and there was tons of circumstantial evidence that you did, and you were found guilty in a court of law and sentenced to prison. You're not some dissident hero journalist who is being persecuted by the state, which is a real thing, and you take away from those people by being this kind of bell. Quote, I am being sentenced to prison for 25 years for writing a book. A book. Don't you see what they are doing? They're constructing this reality and forcing me to live inside. Mate, you're in, you, you're in prison because you murdered someone. Just like his protagonist Chris says, I'm a good liar because I believe in the lies myself. That's what really happened back in 2000. That's one story he's not willing to tell. That means we'll never know the full details of what happened to Darius Janajewski in his final days, such as where exactly did Bala take him after the kidnapping, how long was he held in torture before being tossed in the river, who was the second man that the receptionist saw tailing the victim outside the office. Maybe Bala will drop some hints for us in the upcoming big sequel to a mock, which is tentatively titled De Lyric. Apparently, he's been working on it since going to prison, and he's vowed to finish it from behind bars. 13 years on, and it still hasn't been published. I'm guessing the early reviews from his cellmates were unfavorable. 
wrap up. More important than his plans for another mediocre novel were Bala's plans for another above average murder. Judging by some cryptic documents on his computer, it seemed like he had his next big piece of inspiration lined up, once again targeting a romantic rival. One short text file on his PC read Single, 34 years old, his mum died when he was eight. These details matched up perfectly to Stasha's new boyfriend, who she began seeing not long after Bala's arrest. Chatroom logs showed he had been asking around about this man online, perhaps preparing to draw him in as his second victim. We'll never know for sure, but it's definitely a good thing that he was caught when he was. Yes, 100%. And 25 years is too little. When that guy gets out, they're like, you better be watching him goddamn closely, because clearly he can hold a grudge. I will also watch out. <laughs> Caleb, you watch out as well. And that's pretty much the story so far. Bala, the philosopher killer who ran amok, finally brought to justice by the work of the unorthodox approach of a determined cop. After winning an appeal and being reconvicted in 2008, he has now resigned himself to serving his 25 years in full. The story of how he got himself in that mess turned out to be far more strange and satisfying than anything he ever wrote himself. In fact, the most irritating thing is that this whole affair actually held Bala's prospects as an artist rather than hindered him. Yeah, but he's in prison for 25 years, so enjoy that success as an artist behind bars. Amok would have been largely forgotten within a few years, but after the news broke, Polish bookstores managed to shift tens of thousands of copies as readers combed through the pages for clues. So, Simon, if you're ever looking for a way to give casual crim viewers a shot in the arm, I'm not saying to kill someone, but maybe just a bit of light maiming. <laughs> ah. Oh my god, do you a casual criminalist about a fictionalized casual criminalist about all of my crimes? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's 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 not do crimes, okay? Keep it up your sleeve. That's all I'm saying. Dismembered appendices number one. In 2002, a Polish Crime Stoppers TV show called 997 ran a segment on the Janusz Zewski murder, appealing for information. The landing page for that crime on the show's website logged hits from some strange destinations in the weeks that followed: Korea, America and Japan. When Detective W took a look at Bala's passport stamps, the dates lined up perfectly. Seems like someone was a bit anxious to keep tabs on the case. <laughs> so much circumstantial evidence. Number 2. Christian's novel wasn't even the most disturbing document that Detective W had to read for the investigation. On the killer's laptop, the police found a Word document which was basically a diary of his sexual conquests with 70-odd women. These included prostitutes, his own cousin, and the elderly mother of a friend. Oh my god. <laughs> According to The New Yorker, it featured such beautiful phrases as Joy Juice's old ass hardcore action. Thank Christ that one was never published. Yes, let's just forget it forever and those phrases that just came out of my mouth. Number three. Some reports mention the Butler actually cracked under the pressure during one of the police interviews in April 2006. He reportedly confessed to the killing, then retracted the statement and suffered a fainting spell like some Victorian damsel. The doctor confirmed he was most likely bullshit. Ah, the old spill your guts then play dead gambit. Smooth stuff, Chris. Yes. This one ended in a very with a very, very, very satisfying conclusion. And I hope you enjoyed it as well. It's my favorite one in all for a while, actually. Really nice ending. <laughs> this has been an episode of Casual Criminalist. Thank you to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring it. Thank you for watching or listening how you get this show. If you want to say thank you to me, that would be amazing. You can do that by leaving me a review if you're listening to this show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get it. That would be amazing. If you're watching on YouTube, please do use that thumbs up button. Make sure you're subscribed and I'll see you next time.